Scaling a business is really exciting, but it's not without its own share of hurdles. So today we're gonna dive into four real world case studies of problems that you're probably facing right now or are going to face very soon and how these brands overcame these issues Break them down so that you know not only what these issues are, but how to overcome them with actionable insight. And well, there's no need for surprises. So let's get right into it. So let's start with Starbucks in the late 2000s. Now, Starbucks is a really well-known coffee brand. You probably had some Starbucks this week, maybe. However, during the late 2000s, the company started to experience a really big crisis. They were rapidly expanding and opening a new store on basically every corner. I remember being able to see a Starbucks from another Starbucks. As the company scaled up, they began to face issues of maintaining quality of their product at such a great scale. No company is immune from the impact of the recession, not even the one-time darling of Wall Street, Starbucks. There were a lot of inconsistencies of the taste of the product from location to location. And ultimately, the customer experience was not up to the mark in most locations. The unique Starbucks experience that had defined the brand had really begun to slip away. They also began to see tremendous competition from other brands diving into their fast food coffee space. Brands like Dunkin' Donuts and even McDonald's. Ultimately, this led to a decline of not only the customer's trust and brand loyalty, but ultimately the revenue in their bottom line. So in response to these challenges, Starbucks made a few key strategic moves. In 2008, Howard Schultz rejoined the company as the CEO and began a massive transformation plan. The company decided to close over 900 locations that either had really bad reputations or were massively just underperforming in their area. Schultz also initiated retraining programs for all the baristas to make sure that the company's history of excellence was met at every location. Now, this was a dramatic move because they did it all on the same day. Quite literally, Starbucks closed every location in one day at the same time around the world to train all of their baristas. The company also refocused on the customer experience. They redesigned their stores, re-emphasizing comfort and community to incorporate the Starbucks experience. They also introduced the My Starbucks Reward Program to increase customer loyalty. Additionally, they invested heavily into product innovation and introduced the Via, their instant coffee line, to many new markets. They even bought a coffee farm to ensure the quality of their coffee beans from cultivation to cup. These changes ultimately helped Starbucks regain its footing. They were able to rebuild their brand reputation, increase customer loyalty, and continued their global expansion while maintaining quality of service across the board. What this case study really teaches us is that literally everyone is susceptible to the issue of maintaining quality as you scale. And this is often only overcome with strategic planning and the implementation of training at every level across the board that's standardized. McDonald's themselves also has Hamburger University. There's a reason why these businesses are so successful and it has a lot to do with the fact that the experience and the quality is uniform at every single location. You know what you're going to get. And ultimately, a willingness from management to invest in the necessary changes. So in your business, where is training not standardized? Where is there an assumption of skill set? Where have you abdicated control? Basically giving everything to somebody else, not knowing how they do their work, and if they leave, the person coming in to replace them does it in a completely different way. If you find the place in your business where that's happening, you've found the easiest way to help make scaling a lot easier. So next, let's unpack Amazon and it's very early years and the struggles they overcame to become a world dominating force. So you may or may not know, but amazon.com was launched in 1995 and it quickly grew to be a very prominent online book seller. 
However, for years, Amazon struggled tremendously and famously with cash flow. The company quite literally invested every single penny of profits back into the growth of the business and didn't show a profit until 2001. That's over six years. Now, obviously, this led to massive cash flow issues and prompted criticisms from not only analysts, but also investors. They faced huge costs in warehousing and shipping and processing returns. Not to mention the company was constantly investing in continual growth and innovation into new markets. This was an enormous drain on Amazon's cash reserves and put them on the brink of insolvency. They almost went bankrupt multiple times. Now, we know that despite all of these initial financial hardships, Jeff Bezos and his team ultimately committed to the long-term vision of the Earth's most customer-centric company. They continued to invest all of their profits into continual growth and innovation. And they ultimately expanded their product line well beyond books and also invented their own technologies like Kindle e-readers. Amazon also introduced Amazon Prime in 2005. Now, when it started, it was a free two-day shipping plan on all eligible purchases, among a lot of other benefits. This was a crucial move because it not only improved customer loyalty and increased sales, but it provided a consistent revenue stream. Another significant shift was the launch of Amazon Web Services, commonly known as AWS, in 2006. AWS was a game changer, providing cloud-based computing capabilities to businesses around the world, thus opening up another brand new revenue stream. Now, all of these moves eventually paid off, and there's no way that you can see the end and at the beginning. Now, of course, today, Amazon is a global giant that has divested into various sectors, including entertainment, electronics, as well as physical retail sales. They ultimately overcame their cash flow issues by changing their business model from transactional to investing in the acquisition of future cash flow at a profit, both reoccurring and one-off and ultimately meeting multiple needs to the same customers in different markets. The story of Amazon tremendously illustrates not only the need for a long-term vision and the ability to pivot when you find an opportunity. Remember, they were an online bookstore and now their cloud computing powers one third of the internet in the United States. But also an effort to focus on strategic reinvestment and changing the business model. So many folks get into the game trying to make transactions. A lot of folks in e-commerce are trying to make a profit. This is the ROAS model. And ultimately, while that number isn't even real, what people are trying to focus focus on on that single profit per transaction is the reason that they'll never be nearly as successful as they possibly could because it ultimately inhibits cash flow. Remember, Amazon almost went out of business nearly half a dozen times. They didn't even turn a profit until 2001, six years after they were started. But in a few short years, they had pivoted their business model to the acquisition of future cash flow at a profit. And within two decades, they became one of the world's biggest companies, literally rivaling oligarchs and oil in the Middle East. Hey guys, real quick, if you want to continue to invest in yourself and help to improve your future cash flow, the single best investment that you can make is the Facebook Ads MBA program. Check out down below. It'll be the first link in the description. There's not only weekly classes, but an opportunity for mentorship, consulting, and community with courses on every single thing that you're going to need to know to take it from wherever you are at now to well beyond whatever you think success could be. Just like Jeff Bezos, who tried to start an online bookstore, ultimately became the second richest man in the world. With that being said, let's get back to it. So let's get to the story of Domino's Pizza. In the late 2000s, they were facing a significant branding crisis. Their product quality had fallen off tremendously and was being criticized heavily. And remember the sauce tasted like ketchup and the crust tasted like cardboard. Domino's had built their entire business off a very reliable and fast delivery, but in the 2000s, that wasn't nearly as difficult to get, and they faced an issue of meeting their customer needs, ultimately doing a complete overhaul on the product and made a massive change to their future. 
The big wigs at Domino's Pizza realized that they had completely misplaced their focus. Recognizing that they had lost the customer focus, Domino's Pizza decided to address this head on. They launched the Pizza Turnaround campaign of 2009, which started with them publicly admitting their mistakes and making the commitment to change everything. They quite literally showed real people criticizing their pizza in their advertisements, showcasing a level of transparency that, to put it politely, is extremely rare for any business of any size, much less an international powerhouse. Domino's spent months working on a new recipe and revamping the product line. They changed their pizza entirely from the sauce to the toppings to the crust. They then invited food bloggers to taste the pizza recorded those reactions, and ultimately used those reviews and the subsequent advertising campaigns. Additionally, they introduced the Domino's Tracker, which allowed customers to follow their orders that made its way through the assembly line at Domino's and ultimately into the car and to their front door. This was ultimately a bit of a gimmick, but it's super fun if you ever order Domino's, you can check it out. It's nice to know that like Javier is on the way. And this was a great utilization of technology to improve the customer experience. With their online and mobile app ordering ultimately taking up the majority of the ordering process, people weren't talking to people to place the order. So this connection and feedback was tremendous for the trust in the brand. Now these changes were wildly successful, leading to a significant increase in revenue and the stock price. Since then, the company has continued to innovate, not only with technology, but also food offerings, creating their own subsects of products that literally no other pizza maker in the world is offering. Domino's is a great example of a brand recognizing that they needed to focus on the customer because what got them there is ultimately not what's gonna get them to where they need to go. And having the wherewithal to take dramatic steps to address these issues head on made a dramatic impact on their bottom line as a company. The point here is a lot of businesses as they scale ultimately realize that what made them successful is ultimately going to be what holds them back from achieving new levels of success. Remember, what holds us back more often than not is the metrics we look at, the questions we ask, and what our definition of success is. And as we miss the focus on our customers and get further further and further away from understanding what they want because we're growing a bigger and bigger business that requires more and more of our attention to not be spent on making the customer happy. Well, the customer gets less and less happy with the work that we're doing. And paying attention to their needs is often one of the most profitable things that any business can do. So let's wrap this up with one more story today. And this one is about Google. Now, in the early days of Google, the co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin were basically involved in every decision that had to go on inside the company. As they grew, their hands-on approach ultimately became completely unsustainable and often led to an extreme bottlenecking in decision-making. This resulted in Google's employees and management ultimately feeling as though they didn't have the power to make the decisions that needed to be made when they needed to be made. Google's management and employees famously grew to feel and express openly that they felt they lacked the necessary empowerment to make executive decisions independently. And recognizing the need for change, Google made some very significant adjustments, both to its management structure and to their processes to promote a culture of trust and delegation. One of the most significant changes was the introduction of OKRs, objectives and key results. This was a system popularized by John Dewar. OKRs was a goal setting framework that aims to define clear and measurable objectives and the key results along the way needed to meet those objectives. Implementing OKRs helped ultimately to align the workforce and management to meet very clear needs of the business. It also allowed management to easily and far more strategically delegate tasks to the best teams. And not only that, but trust them to execute appropriately and make the executive decisions independently when needed. 
In 2001, Eric Schmidt was brought in as the CEO. Larry and Sergey knew that they were really good at their jobs, but ultimately what they were good at wasn't managing people who were good at their jobs. Ultimately allowed them to return to their strengths in the strategic and innovative areas of the company. Google famously installed an innovative and open culture that encouraged their employees to spend at least 20% of their free time following their own passions. This practice known as 20% time ultimately helped the brand let their employees innovate some really great tools like Gmail and Google News and AdSense, which if you're watching this video, I'm making a couple of cents. Thank you, 20% time. Through these methods, Google managed to delegate far more effectively. They trusted their teams, and ultimately, that trust and time and delegation allowed their team members to contribute very significantly, not only the strategic direction, but ultimately the innovation that defines what makes Google so strong as a company. It ultimately illustrates that acknowledging one's own limitations is actually one of the greatest strengths and reminds us that we should only be the best person in the room at what we are the absolute best at. When you surround yourself with people who are better than you at everything that you're not the best at, that team can accomplish far more than any one of those people can do on their own. So the path to success of most of these companies is ultimately figuring out who to trust and place your faith and time and effort into. And you've placed your faith and time and trust in me. And if you like this video, please go ahead and smash the like button. I think it's down there somewhere. Yeah, right there. And please go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter. Check out Disruptor School. You'll find links for all that stuff down below. And I want you to know that I know you could be literally anywhere on the internet right now. And you've chosen to spend your time here. For that, I want to say thank you. So please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell so you don't miss anything else. Go ahead and hit like, leave five stars, drop a comment if you have any questions. And until next time, I'll see you on the internet.